Awesome. All right. So good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse and I'm with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those of you joining us for the first time, and there are some of you joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And before we dive in with today's presentation, I just wanted to say a huge uh, hi and uh, thank you. And, and you know, we're all super excited here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants that you guys are back in the classroom. We know it's been a crazy eight months for all of you, uh, but it's nice to see kids in classes, socially distanced, wearing masks, virtual classrooms, staggered starts, whatever you guys are doing, we really appreciate you tuning in with us as we continue to highlight amazing places and people from across the globe. So last week we did an awesome talk with Ripley's Aquarium on their sea turtle feeding, one of the most popular sessions we've done all year, um, and it leads nicely into this other tour highlighting an amazing gallery at the aquarium the largest indoor aquarium in Canada. There are over 16,000 animals there. And so today we're gonna to go to the most diverse habitat in the entire building, the Rainbow Reef exhibit for a really special presentation. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Toki, who's an educator at Ripley's Aquarium. He's gonna walk us through a little bit about what makes Rainbow Reef so special, some of the amazing creatures and the habitat there. So Toki, thanks so much for joining us, man, and take us away. Thank you for the introduction, Jesse. Um, good morning to everyone. It's also nice to meet you, by the way, Jesse. Um, like Jesse said, my name is Toki. I'm an educator here at the Peace Aquarium of Canada. And today I'm excited to show you all our Rainbow Reef Tank. Also joining us today is a special friend of mine. Um, he is a diver here at the aquarium. We've got Pratt. Here we go. Hope you guys can see him. Yeah. So right now Pratt is feeding some of our fish. I believe he brought with him a head of lettuce as well as some Pacific krill. But right now, I think we're focusing on the lettuce. <laughs> Aside from lettuce, we would also bring down a head of bok choy sometimes. And yeah, um, just a few information about Rainbow Reef. It is our fourth largest tank in the aquarium. It contains about 200,000 liters of water or about 53,000 gallons of water. And then, like Jesse mentioned, it is our most biodiverse tank. So here in Rainbow Reef, we are trying to mimic or imitate coral reefs that you would find in the Indo-Pacific Ocean, in the tropical warm waters of Indo-Pacific Ocean. So not only is the um, temperature really cozy, right now Pratt is swimming in 24 degrees Celsius of water, which is around 75 degrees Fahrenheit. It's also very biodiverse, like you mentioned, Jesse. Uh, biodiverse just means that there are a lot of organisms in the ecosystem, a lot of total organisms, as well as at the same time, a lot of different species or different types of organisms. Now in this tank, we currently have about 1,000 fish in total number, and that would be represented by about 100 different species. So since there are that many fish in this tank, I don't know all of them, to be honest. I tried in my first three months when I was still on probation, but now that I am not, let's just say I have a few favorites. Um, I'll focus on those few favorites that, I, that if you're lucky, you will see. Now, let's move a little closer so I can focus on the fish. Ah, so here we go. Now, right, the one that you're seeing right now, this one's called the orbicular batfish. It's, I believe, one of our biggest fish in this tank. Um, they are known to be, to swim in schools. You'll see them swim around together. And also, they have a really nasty reputation in this tank. Um, our divers uh, are, have told us that these orbicular batfish like to bite them on their, on their nails. They get a bit too excited when they're feeding and sometimes on the hair as well, on their hair as well. Now, another fish that I really like in this tank is this one over here. I'll just move the, the uh, screen. Let's see. Oh, there we go. I hope you guys can see it. So that one, um, Call you guys probably know that fish has story <laughs> from the few Disney movies that she's been in. Uh, but in this tank or in the fish world, it's known as the palate surgeon fish. So this um of so information about the palate surgeon fish, it got it, it got its name because it has a uh a really sharp spine at the part where their tail meets their body. 
And that spine is said to be sharper than a scalpel. Yeah, so if you accidentally touch it, you might just get injured. Um, a lot of the uh, fish in this tank actually have a lot, have really sharp spine. So this tank is actually one of the tanks that the, high, the, that the divers hate going into, um, more so than all the other tanks, than the colder tanks. Also, some fact about Dory is that in the ocean, they are known to be able to cause food poisoning. Uh, I, I believe it's called ciguatera poisoning. So if you see Dory in the ocean, it's best to leave her alone. And then my last favorite fish, or the last fish that I'll focus on for now is, let's see if it's swimming around. Oh, here we go. I'll just focus on that fish real quick. So it's the clam trigger fish. Oh no, it moved behind the coral. Um, let's see. We might see it swim around again. Oh yeah, here we go, sorry for moving constantly, but this one over here, yeah, that's called the clown triggerfish. <laughs> it's swimming close to Pratt right now. Yeah, that one over there. So the clown triggerfish, you probably noticed that it's got a soccer ball belly. And um, they are also known to be very aggressive, be very aggressive, the uh, clown triggerfish and territorial, especially in this tank, we only keep one because if we have more than one, they might just end up fighting each other. And even in the ocean, they are known to be very aggressive. Um, I'm Divers in the ocean have said that they are, if they wander too close to the nest of the triggerfish, they, the triggerfish might just end up biting them or uh, showing some signs of aggression. Um, I can attest to that. When I was a kid, I remember a triggerfish biting me on my knee. I, I don't know why on my knee, but yeah, I remember them biting me on my knee. Now, a cool fact that I love about the triggerfish is that in the ocean, they can communicate to each other uh, by making grunting noises, and they can also uh, ward off any unwanted intruders by making those grunting noises. Um, that's something that not a lot of people would think about, uh, noise in the ocean or sound in the ocean. Specifically in a coral reef, um, each coral reef would have their own unique sound, and this sound will actually be uh, tell other fish if the reef is lively or not. And each diver can attest to hearing the really lively sense of a coral reef. Um, another cool information about why sound is important for the ocean and for coral reef is that most fish can actually tune into this sound. For example, um, any fish that are migrating, say a, new, a baby clownfish, a baby Nemo, if they need to move to a new coral reef, you know, they would need to listen into the sound of the coral reef. They're trying to figure out if there's a lot of competition for them or if there's enough space for them. If there's enough space for them in the coral reef, they'll migrate to, the coral, to that coral reef. Now, let's move our focus a bit onto corals. Um, all, over, all over the world, there are about 6,000 species of corals, uh, I guess, in total. Um, I would like to focus on the hard corals or the stony corals, which you would see here as examples. I do have a confession to make though before I go any further. Um, these corals are these corals in this aquarium and throughout the aquarium are actually fake. Um, we decided to uh, go with fake corals because uh, if you take too much coral from the ocean, it will be really devastating. Also, if these were real corals, Pratt won't be able to uh, be able to uh, move the corals like that because they are very sensitive. That's also one reason why we decided to go for fake corals because so that our divers can swim in and feed the fish if they need to be hand fed or just swim around and clean the tank. Now, another reason why we decided to go for fake corals is that corals are known to grow slowly. In a year, their average growth rate is recorded to be somewhere between two centimeters to 10 centimeters or an in inches. That would be about slightly less than one inch up to about four inches. Yeah. Now, anyway, let's get back to uh, corals. Um, if you've ever swam in the ocean and saw corals and probably wondered what corals are, if they were animals, plants or rocks, they're actually a bit a mix of all those three, a bit of a mix of all those three. So one big coral, for example, let's focus on this brick, big green brain coral over here. One coral is actually made up of a colony of animals called polyps. Um, if you want to imagine what a polyp looked like, just think of a uh, sea anemone, only microscopic and colorless. 
uh, microscopic or very, very, very small, basically. And then in the tissues of these polyps would be these plants that are living in, or uh, plant-like organisms called algae living in their tissues. Um, they're also known as zooxanthellae, their specific scientific name. But let's just focus on algae because the other name is a bit wordy. wordy. So these polyp and algae will be um, living close to each other. And in biology, that relationship is called symbiosis. Um, a symbiotic relationship basically just means that the, orga the organisms that are living close to each other are benefiting from each other. So the polyp will be providing essential protection and shelter to the algae. And then the algae will be providing essential nutrients so that the polyp can grow and overall the coral can grow. Now, the rock part of a coral is actually their skeleton. So these polyps will be absorbing calcium from their surrounding, which they would use to form their skeleton. And eventually their, their skeleton will harden up and become a part of the reef. So corals all over the world are experiencing this event or phenomenon that we call, or they're experiencing it more frequently, um, this event called coral bleaching. Coral bleaching is when corals are put under so much stress that the polyps tend to kick out the algae that are living in their tissues, the important algae. Um, and when that happens is their color changes. They, instead of being really nice and bright, instead of having really nice and bright colors, they would turn stark white. I actually have an example of a bleach coral that I will show you guys. Let me just move the screen a bit. Like, sorry for the uh, movement. Here we go. I'll bring it under the light. Uh, yeah, there we go. So instead of being colorful, like what you can see on the right, I guess, on the right of the screen, it'll turn really stark white, like you can see here on the left. So bleaching events, um, they can occur naturally, or they can occur naturally, and they can also be caused by human impacts. Right now, what we are noticing is that most of the coral bleaching events are because of us humans and our impact to the environment. Um, our impact, such as climate change. Um, I, and also, I understand that plastics or microplastics is a part of this, uh, this month's topic, so I'll tie that into this conservation message. Um, in regard, going back to climate change, um, you all probably know climate change is when there are too many greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. And what happens, with, what happens is, uh, the heat that the Earth receives from the sun can't exit the Earth because of all these greenhouse gases. Now, plastic production actually uh, emits a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Plastic is actually a fossil fuel product. We use crude oil to create plastic and many other things that we use in our daily life. Now, climate change specifically causes two um, issues to the ocean. One is ocean warming or the ocean water becoming too hot. And then the other is ocean acidification, the ocean water becoming too acidic or the pH becomes too low. Both of those things are really stressful for corals. And like I said, with bleaching, the corals might just end up kicking out the uh, algae that are living in their tissues. Now, um, how can, before we talk, before we even talk about, oh, uh, another issue with plastic, by the way, microplastics in the ocean, is that corals can eat microplastics. Corals are known to be able to eat zooplankton's or really small insects. And microplastics, unfortunately, has the same size and I guess color as the zooplankton's. So, so they can sometimes eat these microplastics. And um, what happens to corals when they eat microplastics is their feeding rate, apparently decreases and their growth rate as well. So they won't grow as much, they won't eat as much. Also, they won't be able to photosynthesize as well as they normally would be. So before we talk about how we can help corals out, why are corals important in the first place? Well, one reason, I'll give you guys a few reasons. One is that um, the ocean actually creates a lot of the oxygen, oxygen that we breathe in the atmosphere and the algae in the corals and the algae living around the uh, coral reef are actually respond, are putting in a lot of work into that. Um, we get a lot of oxygen from the corals, from corals basically, and the um, microorganisms living around the corals. Also, we get a lot of our recent medications from corals and we believe that we can get more medications from corals 
And also, corals play an important role in the economy. Uh, I believe the Great Barrier Reef is responsible for creating about $60 billion in income. And it can create about, or $6 billion, not $60, but $6 billion, excuse me. And they can, it can also create 60,000 jobs per year. So yeah, corals are really important. Now, how can we help corals out? Well, for issues such as climate change, what we can do is to decrease our carbon footprint, um, recycle, uh, use less energy if, it's, if we can, um, use public transportation if we can, or bike or walk to wherever we need to go if we can, and also use less plastic, uh, especially single-use plastics, such as plastic bags that you would get from grocery stores. Instead of uh, using those, we can just bring our own tote bags. And also coffee cups. Um, I, I know coffee cups are made of paper, but they are also lined with wax inside, and wax is a fossil fuel product. So yeah, changing all of those small things in our life can help out with climate change. Fantastic. Toby, this is great, man. We got some beautiful imagery. We've got some solutions that kids can implement at home. We've got some of the highlights of why coral is such an important ecosystem and uh, organism in the ocean. Uh, so thank you so, so much. And if you're okay with it, let's, let's dive in with a few questions. Perfect, man. Um, by the way, it seems like the diver can hear you. I don't know if he can speak back to you, but that's just a, a good note to know if we can, because then some of the kids can ask questions of the diver that you can relate to us. I the case? Can, we can communicate yeah. with the diver through whiteboard, uh, through a whiteboard, cool. but we can't speak to the diver directly right now. No, sometimes it's a little different, just wanted to make sure. Yeah. Um, so we've got 75 groups on YouTube joining us. Uh, a few of you have already let me know where you're joining from. We've got a bunch of St. Thomas, Ontario. We've got Round Rock, Texas. If you're joining from anywhere else, please let me know in the chat bar. I'd love to take some of your questions. Some of our live groups, uh, I actually don't know where you guys are coming from, some of our live groups. So if you want to let me know in the chat, in the private chat too, I'd love to see that. But what we'll do is we'll start with Mr. Faraday's class. So Mr. Faraday's class is joining us in Ottawa, Ontario, grade eight. Uh, come on in guys, if you have a question for us, take us away. All right. Thanks so much for having us, Jesse and uh, Toki. Thanks so much for all the great information. We're in Ottawa, Ontario. And as you can see, we're all masked up with our socially distant class. And Callie has a question way at the back. Go ahead, shout it out, Callie. Um, I'm pretty sure the first coral you guys showed us was brain coral. Is that right? Yes, you are correct. Oh, in coral. Let me just bring the screen back to that coral. Here we go. Cool question. Yeah. That was a quick and speedy question. Great question, guys. Uh, let's go to Mr. Gray's class, joining us in Sudbury, Ontario, with our kindergartners. Mr. Gray, welcome into Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so I see we saw Dory, Dora, Dory, but. Sure. Is, is um, Nemo in there? Ooh. Um, that's a really good question. So <laughs> right now we have a tomato clownfish, Nemo's cousin. We used to have a few Nemos or a clownfish, plain clownfish in this tank, but they didn't really like the environment, so they didn't really proliferate in this environment. So right now, no Nemo, but we have his cousin. He's hard to find. I remember from being at the aquarium that, you know, every second day I would lose, uh, you know, sort of fake Nemo. But if you find him, let us know. <laughs> cool, Togi. Um, by the way, big shout out to all of North Palm Beach, Florida. I think the entire town is joining us on YouTube right now. So that's exciting. At least three or four classes. That's awesome. Welcome in, everyone. Um, let's go to Mr. Hill joining us in Keswick, Ontario. Uh, come on in, Mr. Hill. And yeah, go for it. Thanks, Jesse. Uh Damon in grade eight wants to know, Toki, what's a typical day at work at Ripley's Aquarium? And uh, is it a fun job? Nice. Thank you for the question, Damon. Um, it is a very fun job, especially if you're into marine organisms, if you're into learning a lot of fish. Now, what is a typical day like? Well, for my job specifically, I, could, I would say that I would start the morning by preparing for the day. Um, I forgot, uh, I probably mentioned in the beginning, but I'm an educator in this tank. So my main, or in the aquarium, my main role is to uh, help out with any educating roles for homeschooling classes, or sometimes if class, if 
a school would come into the aquarium for any field, treat, field trip. That's when, where I would help out. Uh, I would say you're probably more interested in a diver's day in an aquarium. Diver like Pratt, the, uh, my friend Pratt over here, his day would start by going into the kitchen and prepare food for all of our fish. Um, by prepare, I just mean he would slice up the food into smaller pieces or sizes that the fish can eat. And then throughout the day, we'll, they will be feeding the fish. And also Pratt goes into the tank uh, occasionally throughout the day or a few times throughout the day to uh, manually clean the tank or to hand feed any fe fish that needs hand feeding. But yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Toki. Um, all right. A great follow-up to that question from Ms. Gertson and Bueller Candace on YouTube. And if you're on YouTube, share questions. We'd love to see them there. So her class of grade fours wanted to know what's the most interesting thing you've ever experienced at work, Toki? And you personally, not the dyers. We want to know about you, man. <laughs> oh, myself. Or um, It's really hard to think because there's a lot of moments that uh, I find really interesting. I guess most recently, I saw our two... Uh, turtles trying to, uh, our two turtles spot and chewy, they were trying to uh, fight each other, I guess, or squabble. They are the only turtles we have in this aquarium. Uh, and they're in the same tank and they're very close. Um, one turtle, uh, chewy, is actually, I would say, um, a bit stronger, I guess, compared to spot. So chewy was uh, trying to pick on spot. That one I found interesting. Okay, awesome. Turtle drama in the, the dangerous lagoon. Um, yeah. Let's go to Royal Orchard School, uh, grade sixes. Guys, come on in and uh, you have a question for us at Royal Orchard? Go for it. Uh, yeah, uh, what happens uh, when a fish dies? Uh, the fish dies. Uh, the fish dies. Uh, yeah, good question, guys. That's a really good question. Hmm. What happens when a fish dies? So for this aquarium, whenever we see a dead animal, a dead fish, we would pick it up immediately and do a necropsy. A necropsy basically is when our aquarist or aquarium biologists would dissect the uh, fish or the de dead organism, I guess, to check if the cause of death is natural or something that is because of the aquarium. If it's something that's because of the aquarium, we can immediately change it. That's why we try and do the necropsies. But if it's natural, uh, we, it helps us know what happened to the animal, and we can't really change anything about that. But yeah, we do necropsies. Yeah, great question, guys. Toki, you're whipping through these, man. This is exciting. I think we got through six questions in two minutes. It's like a record all time. <laughs> um, let's go to Miss Hill, also in Keswick. Miss Hill, if you have a question for us for your class, go for it. Hi there. This is our first time joining. So we're a virtual school right now. And um, I actually have um, a really quick question, so I'm hoping I can ask too. Uh, Venusha is wondering if there are really? any uh, seahorses in this tank. And then we're also wondering how you make sure that the fish are healthy. Yeah, um, those are really good questions. Uh, starting with the seahorse, we don't have any seahorse in this tank specifically, but in the aquarium, we have a tank dedicated for them. And um, in regards to how we know the fish are doing well or are healthy, now the best way to check if an animal in captivity is doing well is if they are eating. Um, that's, uh, that's how we, ch uh, we check uh, most of our animals if they're doing well. And yeah, right now you probably saw Pratt with the uh, head of lettuce and a lot of the fish were eating. And that, th those are not all of the fish in this tank. Uh, we have a few fish in this tank that are shy, I guess, or would want to eat later on. For those fish, we tend to feed them later on in the day by with f fish flakes. Yeah, eating is a good sign to check if uh, animals are doing good or not. Awesome, fantastic questions, guys. All right, we're gonna go to Teacher Lore, um, who I'm so excited to find out exactly where you're doing from. Is this Ms. Picaro? Hi. Uh yeah, we're we're a uh, virtual school right now. Uh, can I share my screen so you can see my students? Absolutely, go for it. We'd love to see your students. Okay. Perfect. Let me get that. Okay, up. here they are. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> we are right. Uh, we are from Mexico, and do you have a question for us? Did you listen to? It? 
Uh, yeah, well, a student asked, how do you take care of the fish in the tank? Yeah. Toby, did you catch that? Oh, Toby, are you frozen? <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> All right, we're gonna. Toby's got at least he froze in like this awesome scene with like an epic coral reef and the diver cleaning the coral. So uh, the short answer to this, as someone who's worked there in the past, and I can field a few questions while we're waiting to get Toki or Katie back online. Oh, Katie might be in. Let's see. Katie, hi. Hey, it's actually Toki. My phone. Died. I'm so sorry, Jesse. That's fine. Good man. <laughs> so the question was, how do you take care of all the fish? Is there like systems in place? How do you actually maintain the health of all these animals? Okay, that's a really good question. It's also a very broad question, and I will try my best to give you a really good answer. Um, starting with how we feed our animals, we do have certain schedules for the animals as to when we feed them, and we try and feed them multiple times a day or depending on the animal, multiple times a week. Say, for example, these fish here at Rainbow Reef, we try and feed them, about, I would say, about right now under the pandemic, about four to, three to four times per day. Uh, before the pandemic, we would be feeding them about five or six times per day. Um, for some of our other animals, say for example, the sharks, uh, we have them on a schedule where we would feed them, try to feed them three times per week. That doesn't always mean that the sharks will be eating every time we try and feed them, but that guarantees that whenever they are hungry, we are there to feed them, basically. We are there to give them their food. Um, in regards to cleaning the tank, our water filters are always working. Uh, and that itself is a good way to clean the tank. But also sometimes, like as you can see what Pat is doing right now, there are really hard places or difficult to clean places in a tank. And that's when our divers would go into the tank to manually clean the, uh, those parts. They would put in some elbow grease to help them out. And I guess in regards to an animal's direct health, um, we do have, or we check uh, the water chemistry of each of our tanks. Water chemistry is really a really good way to tell even if they're, if an an, if the animals are doing well or not. An excess of a certain chemistry or a certain chemical, I guess, would indicate that there might be something going on in the tank that we would want to change. Um, for other for other direct uh, I guess ways to take care of our animals, we do have a veterinarian that goes uh, that works for the aquarium. Our veterinarian is here every Wednesday, and the ver the veterinarian the vet uh, I believe it's anyway the veterinarian right now is a specialist for all of these organisms for all these an animals tropical animals and even sharks and stingrays. And also, if the veterinarian isn't here, we have our aquarium biologists. They interact with our animals every day, and they check our animal health every day. Yeah. Fantastic, Toki. One thing that I've been mentioning uh, in a lot of our past Ripley's Aquarium presentations or the Toronto Zoo and other amazing organizations we partner with is AZA or CAZA certification. So one of the questions we get a lot is, you know, how do you make sure the animals are taken care of? It's a really common query. Uh, people are always concerned about the welfare of animals. And so if you look for AZA, Association of Zoos and Aquariums, or CAZA, the Canadian equivalent of that, that means that the institution, the aquarium or the zoo is held to the highest standard of animal care. They've got tons of staff that are dedicated to maintaining the health of the animals uh, in their care. And so if you look for those uh, and make those decisions when you go to facilities like this, you'll help ensure that the animals are being well cared for and that it's a top-notch place. So check for A's at A, C A's at A, wherever you go, and, and I'm really glad we got that question. All right, let's check in with Miss Delgado joining us in Homestead, Florida. Miss Delgado, welcome in. And let's just de-mute your mic and you'll be good to go. And we'd love to hear one of your questions. Hi, good morning. Um, this was a really great experience for our students because we do have a, um, a coral reef uh, very close by in the Florida Keys. And, and so this is a good way for them to get some ideas um, about how to, they can help our locally. Um, we had a, we had a wonderful question, but um, a comment uh, kind of came up as we heard um, there uh, that they reducing the amounts of the times that they feed the fish because of the situation that we're now facing with coronavirus. How, how has that impacted the, the procedures that you take with the fish um, as far as, you know, what, uh, do you have to do anything special when the divers go in or how does that, how has that changed your routine? That's a really good question. Um, 
in terms of it hasn't really changed much in terms of how we would take care of our animals and uh, the frequency. Oh, um, for certain tanks, we did try, and, for example, Rainbow Reef. And we have another tank in this aquarium called Ray Bay. For those tanks, we did try and make a show of when we would, whenever we would be feeding the animals. Um, for those situations, we just decreased the frequency of when we would feed the animals, but we would increase the amount of food that would go into the tank. So for example, um, for Rainbow Reef, like I said earlier, we would feed them five or six times before, before the pandemic. Uh, and right now, during the pandemic, we would feed them about three to four times. Uh, and yeah, we would just feed them a little bit more. We would give them a little bit extra to make up for the uh, lost, I guess, lost feeding schedule. Yeah. Um, in terms of the divers, the aquarists going into the tank, I don't think there is any direct change as to how they would, as to their procedures. Um, uh, I'm not sure if this is what you're directly asking, but um, since the, uh, or you could be curious about this as well, I mean, uh, since the uh, coronavirus is a virus for mammals, it's not a big issue for all of the fish. Um, if anything, uh, I guess the closest animal that we would be concerned about in the aquarium uh, in terms of transmitting the uh, coronavirus and even then transmitting the coronavirus to this animal is the possibility is really, really low and really difficult. Um, it would be the turtles because they do have lungs, they're reptiles. But yeah, like I said, it's not a big concern. Um, almost, almost a really, really low possibility. Um, I guess the biggest change uh, for that the pandemic brought to the aquarium is uh, the amount of people that are here right now, I guess. Also, um, our fish ends up getting lonely, specifically the stingrays. They do miss interacting with people. Uh, the first, I, I heard the first few days where we let people back in, all of our stingrays were just swimming close to the to the to the uh, tank, to the glass part of the tank, and are here. We're curious about the people, but yeah, it really didn't change much in terms of our people or for the fish's health. Cool. That was a very comprehensive answer, Toki. Thanks, man. <laughs> no uh, worries. All right, we're going to try and do another round of questions in the room. I'm going to go to Mr. Forty's class back in Ottawa. So, if you guys want to come back in. Uh, ask another. Go for it. Uh, oh, please. <laughs> you're, you're, you're in. You're in. You're all upset. No, no. You muted yourself. There you go. You're perfect. <laughs> right. I, sorry. I just joined the class. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, welcome in. Uh, if any of the students have a question about Rainbow Reef, you're welcome to ask it. And if not, that's okay, too. You can just listen along. Looks like one student does. All right, looks like Callie's the only one with a burning question again. Callie? Sure, Callie. Uh, why do you feed the fish less during the pandemic than you did after and this before the pandemic? Yeah. So why? Why, Toki? <laughs> That's a really good question, Callie. Um, mainly it's because of the uh, manpower or the available pe people or the available diver or the available occurs that can feed the fish. Since uh, we, not a lot of people are very, um, or the amount of people that are comfortable into going to work during the pandemic are less compared to before the pandemic. So yeah, that's the main reason. Awesome. So it just, you know, with regards to any animal care facility, there's certain staff that, you know, they're going to need to make accommodations for that. And so we covered that with Ms. Delgado's question too. So good question, guys. I'm glad we actually got that twice. I was going to ask it if no one else did. Um, Mr. Hill, back to you. If you have another question for us, go for it. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, yeah, Lucas in grade eight wants to know how much does it cost to run an aquarium like this with a thousand fish and uh, over a hundred different species? Yeah. Mm, that's a really good question. And to be honest, I don't know the answer. Um, the finances part of running an aquarium goes way over my head. <laughs> It's a lot though. So we know that um, just by comparison, I know the Toronto Zoo might be a little bit bigger, but it was millions of dollars just to feed the animals at the Toronto Zoo. And so amidst COVID, they did a major fundraiser for that to help uh, offset that cost. The same sort of thing applies at Ripley's Aquarium. We're talking restaurant quality food for many thousands of animals uh, every day on a daily basis, plus staff time, plus maintaining the systems, all the electricity that goes into this. One of the questions on YouTube was about keeping the tanks at a certain temperature. So every tank needs to be maintained uh, no matter what's happening uh, with backup generators to boot. So there's a lot that goes into running a major facility like this um, and it would be substantial. So any institution where 
public uh, access uh, is a huge part of that operating cost. It's a challenging time for, for any attraction around the world. Uh, Ripley's Aquarium is open though, so people can go to Ripley's Aquarium. They do uh, have you know all social distancing measures in place. So I encourage you to check that out if you're in the general Toronto area, because it's really a, a remarkable organization and, and place to visit. Um, let's go back to Royal Orchard. If you guys have another question for us, come on up. We do a bunch of questions, so we're going to email you after. Cool. Some of these He's here. <laughs> Why is the coral? Could you repeat that last bit? Yeah. So he's saying in, in a coral reef, um, what what is the what is the function of the coral itself? Is it food? Is it habitat? Is it both? Yeah. Awesome. Great question. Yeah. So that's a really good question. Um, for coral reefs, a coral is actually the uh, foundation or. Um, the, uh, I guess in terms of trophic levels or in terms of um, the food chain, they would be the primary producers. And also at the same time, they provide shelter for all of the animals. Um, I mentioned earlier that corals ha is a mix of plants, animals, and rocks. The rock part, the reef part, that provides a lot of shelter for about 25% uh, of the fish population uh, overall in the ocean. And... It also provides food because a lot of fish can actually eat the polyps and the uh, al the zooxanthellae or the algae in the coral itself. And also, aside from the uh, polyp, the zooxanthellae, there are other primary producers in coral reefs, such as seagrass or other or uh, blue green bacteria, cy cyanobacteria, and other micro or other al algae. I would say, but yeah, yeah. Awesome. Uh, they're pretty much everything. We've done well over 100 coral broadcasts uh, on this program. You can check any of our past sessions out on Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants on YouTube, so I'd encourage you to do that. Um, one thing that I'd love to highlight, and I always like to talk about when we have coral presentations, is them spawning. So coral laying eggs, which no one really thinks about them doing, but is one of the coolest things in all of nature. It's like fireworks underwater. So I've linked the video in the private chat. I'm going to share it with all the registered classes at the end. And I've put it up in a banner on the bottom of the screen. So coral spawning, one of the coolest things you've ever seen, three minute video and well worth it to cap off this broadcast. Um, let's go for three more questions. Toby, you're killing it, man. Uh, Miss Hill, if you want to uh, come up for one, go for it. And uh, yeah. All right. Thank you. So my students are also wondering with so many different uh, species of fish and so many fish in the tank, where do they come from? Like how, what's the process for actually um, finding and getting fish for these aquariums? Awesome. That's a really good question. So for our aquarium specifically, and I guess I would say a lot of the um, AZA affiliated aquariums, uh, we would get most of our fish from other aquariums. Uh, in other aquariums, certain fish are allowed to breed or are there are there are breeding programs. And we don't really want to take any more fish from the ocean. So whenever we can, we will get them from other aquariums. Since we are all connected through the AZA and I guess uh, we have personal connections. Yeah, we just try and talk to each other if we're in need of certain species of fish. Yeah, that's a really good question. A great question. They talked about the turtles in the turtle presentation last week too, that it came from a, a university that was previously associated with a research institute. So some animals come that way. Some animals do come from the wild, but it's very well regulated on a world scale uh, when that happens. So lots of, you can find out more of that information on the website and in general for aquariums and zoos. And again, a sign that a zoo or aquarium is going to be a top notch facility is that certification. And part of that, um, part of the certification process is to prove that they're getting their animals in a you know, sustainable and reasonable way. So cool question, guys. All right, let's go back to Yucatan, Merida, Mexico. If you guys have another question for us, just demute your microphone and uh, share away. <laughs> sure. Uh, my students would like to know which fish is the hardest to take care of in the aquarium? Yeah. That's a really good question. Um, I would say right now, it's one of our turtles uh, spot. Her Spot has had some health issues recently, and we are trying to keep a close eye on Spot. Um, in general, uh, the hardest to take care of, I would say, would be the uh, weedy sea dragons or any sea dragon, if ever, if you've ever heard of any sea dragon, because sea dragons are really um, hard. They're really hard to take care of. They're very photosensitive, so we need to uh, add some light, some ways to filter in the light that goes into the tank for. Um, in case anyone would want to take a photo of the sea dragons. But yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, another thing, and I'll pass this along as well. I'll remind myself to do this. Leafy and weedy sea dragons. I just brought them up in a banner. Some of the most beautiful animals in the entire face of the earth. Um, if you ever get a chance to go to the aquarium and see them in person, do. They're just astonishing animals. Um, so I'm glad those got brought up. All right. We have time for one more question, Toby. So let's go back to Miss Delgado all the way down in Florida. Uh, if you have a question to wrap us up, go for it. Yes, um, you mentioned the symbiotic relationship between the uh, coral reef and the fish. So if the with coral bleaching, is there any effect uh, directly to the fish? Yeah, that is a really good question. And that's one thing that I always think about because I'm very passionate about coral reefs. Um, in regards to the fish and, or, and their symbiosis, symbiotic relationship with corals, in a bleaching event, what could happen is most of the uh, fish, I mentioned earlier, 25% uh, of the fish species in the ocean relies. Most of the fish would probably need to migrate to other coral reefs that hasn't bleached because you can have one bleached coral reef, but also you can have another that's probably a few, say, a few miles away that isn't bleached. Um, in those situations, the fish would migrate to healthier reefs. But also, that doesn't mean that there won't be any life in a coral reef uh, in bleaching events. There would be a few fish, but it won't be as bi biodiverse as a healthy reef. Um, in those cases, uh, I guess the biggest issue is the decrease in biodiversity. Uh, an ecosystem that isn't really biodiverse is really prone to um, crumbling, I would say, or um, ex I guess um, dis disappearing, I guess is a better term, or vanishing from Earth or ex going extinct, I guess, if I want to push it too far. But yeah. Those are some of the uh, impacts of bleaching on fish. Yeah, so if in some of our past presentations, they've shown images of reefs uh, where the same person went back 10 years later and saw it after a bleaching event, it is catastrophic. It's one of the things that will, you know, is one of the most shocking images of the effects of climate change, habitat destruction in the world. It's equivalent to seeing like a rainforest that's been paved over, right? It's, uh, it's quite distressing actually. Uh, and so the good news about that is that there are a lot of things that we can do to help coral and they are, you know, everything Toki mentioned at the beginning of the broadcast from curbing your plastic use to curbing your emissions. Basically, they all fall under the banner of don't waste, whether that's emissions, food, uh, you know, plastic, whatever it may be. If you don't waste, you can help coral reefs, um, you know, come back to their, their former glory and, uh, and promote ecosystems like what we're seeing in front of us. So, Togi, this has been fantastic, man. Thank you so, so much. Thank you for having me, Jesse. I had a lot of fun talking to uh, or sharing to you, all of you our Green Reef Tank. Yeah, like at least a dozen classrooms from around the world, uh, both live and on YouTube. So awesome and, and welcome into everyone. Before we wrap up, I just want to note, uh, we have the one week uh, mark left for Backyard Bio. So if you aren't familiar with this, it's our campaign all September long at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants to encourage you guys to get out in nature, explore, document, observe, and share the wildlife that lives near you. Maybe you don't live uh, in, in Florida near a lot of coral reefs, but maybe you're in the middle of Ontario or wherever you're joining from from around the world. There's incredible wildlife near you and on iNaturalist on Twitter and through direct connections with other classrooms we'd love to see what you guys can find one week left for Backyard Bio and then we'll be running it again in May so hope you guys can check that out and what we do now to get the end of every broadcast I'm going to bring in every single one of our teachers so Mr. Farley, Mr. Hill, Miss Hill, Royal Orchard, Mexico and Miss Delgado if you guys want to say a big goodbye and thank you so much we will wrap up from there thanks so much thanks, that was great